when we made these recordings, they sounded so different that one critic wrote that it stood the audio world on its ear. Two things came together that made Mercury Living Presence possible. The gathering of the people and also the gathering of the technology. My name is Tom Fine. I'm the reissue producer and remastering engineer for the current releases of Mercury Living Presence. I am the son of the original producer, Will McCozart Fine, and the original recording engineer, C. Robert Fine. My mother, Will McCozart Fine, began work for Mercury in 1950. She had been hired to oversee the classical department. She did this for a couple of months, and then she told the president, Irving Green, who was in Chicago, I don't see where your label is going here, and you need to have content if you're going to have a classical label. Right now is a, is a great time to get content because there are major orchestras that are not signed to labels, one of which is the Chicago Symphony, your hometown symphony, which is getting this new conductor, Raphael Kubelik. You should sign them. And surprisingly, Irving Green said, sure. 1951, April 23rd to be specific, uh, my father went out to Chicago and made the first recording. The Mussorgsky Ravel pictures at an exhibition. Mercury Living Presence started out as full track mono tapes. And when stereo came along, they were the first American label to record classical music with Ampex's then brand new 300 three track. My father was well familiar with recording on magnetic film because he did a lot of sound for picture work, a lot of movie soundtrack work. So my father suggested to my mother, let's, let's try this with Mercury Sessions. In practice, the 35 millimeter masters are a bit quieter. It's sprocketed film, so it's, it's very speed stable. That's, that's the big thing. My mom was good at marketing, so Mercury, you know, put the 35 millimeter film strip across the top and everything. And, you know, it was, it was good marketing. They sold well. She had the ears in the organization. He had the gear and knew how to use it. So it was, it was not just Wilma by herself and Bob by himself. It was a collaboration of the two. My mother would be up in the recording room. Also at the session would be Harold Lawrence, the music director. She would be listening to the microphones as they were placed and have final say on the microphone placement. Her manner of saying this to my father would be, I'm not hearing enough second strings, or the oboe sounds too far back. And he, he would know how to move the microphones to, to solve that problem. So these are the Sheps M201 microphones. These are the three that were used for the Mercury recordings. You see L, C, and R for left, center, and right. Um, this is what they look like. So in 1956, my mother got made a corporate vice president, fully in charge of the classical division. My father was never an employee of Mercury. He was always a contractor for Mercury. And they were married in 1957. They had quite a few adventures in those early years of marriage, going around the world making recordings. It's taken years of negotiations with the Russians, but finally an American sound truck is parked outside the conservatory to the wonder of admiring crowds. Mercury's solo piano artist at that time was Byron Janis. Byron was beloved by Russian audiences. So they, they recorded all these tapes and films, and the Russians kept dickering about finally, you know, doing the final signing of the contract. Here you get to the last day where the truck is going to be shipped out. Harold Lawrence had bought this new luggage, and my father was like, Harold, I need your new suitcases. They ripped this lining out of the suitcases, packed them to the hilt with tapes and with master tapes and films, only left blank tape and film in the truck and sent those suitcases back with the CBS News reporter who had a diplomatic passport. My mother decided in 1964 to retire to raise a family. After 1967, it was 
the classical division of Mercury was kind of a minor thing. The problem was that the legacy didn't last on records. The Mercury Living Presence brand had kind of been kept alive in the audiophile world. This is where the collector market sprang up with the old original LPs because they all went out of print. So you ended up with a shortage of stereo records when Harry Pearson and a few other people started rediscovering the glories in the groove in the late 70s and early 80s. In particular, there was a magazine, The Absolute Sound, that had written extensively about the old Mercury LPs and had even commissioned Mike Gray to write a two-part history of Mercury Living Presence. Late 1980s, Nancy Zanini, who was the head of Phillips Classics in our New York office, partnered with Polygram Europe and they decided to release the Mercury Living Present series on CD. We had over 100,000 masters uh, in our vault, including all of the Mercury masters. It makes sense. It makes sense from the marketing point of view to get the people involved who did it and to resuscitate it. So my mother said, I need to get with Bob Eberins because we need to get my equipment in here. I don't, I don't want to work with this modern equipment. We were lucky we had Bob Eberens, one of the old fine sound guys, help us with restoring the uh, half-inch Ampex tape machine and the 35 millimeter mag machines so we could transfer directly to digital. Then the, for the three to two mix down console, for whatever reason, Bob had made sure to keep it. So it was in his house, in his basement. Three tracks of music are combined into the final two just as they were for the original LP releases of this material. Well then Phillips said, work on the digital side. See what you can do. We listened to a lot of converters. She would always say, that sounds like cardboard. That was one of her, her, big, her big problems with, with some of the converters. Then Phillips had been working with DCS, with, with this company in England, DCS, to make a different kind of analog to digital converter, which was the DCS 900 and they said, why don't you try this? And we were really looking for the, the depth that you get in analog, the wide sound stage, the nuances. We did some comparisons on the DCS. Woman looks at me and says, that's a better bowl of soup. <laughs> so her ears were the key. Her ears and taste were the key to how this came out, the CDs for people to listen to. From the first recordings, you can hear the definite personality and the definite sound of Mercury Living Presence. I think people remember that and they like that. They're attached to these recordings. 